This is Peak Earth. I'm Case Bradford. Thank you for tuning in to this episode with Dana Doswell. I learned a ton in this conversation. Dana is a brilliant nervous system coach and learning about nervous system regulation is awesome. Working with the cycles of nature inside and out, evolving to self-expression, the power of having a pick a lady and practicing entrepreneurship and evolutionary mismatch theory. We reference a few books and podcasts in this conversation. All the links to those will be down below, along with everything to connect with Dana across social media, her website, etc. If you are new to Be Girth, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. If you're returning, welcome back. Really appreciate you taking the time to listen in. I hope you enjoy this podcast as much as I enjoy creating it. If you feel like contributing to Peak Earth, came up with a few ideas. One could be taking a moment to drop a five-star review on the Spotify app or the Apple app. Those always make me smile. Another could be sharing an episode out across social media with a friend. That's cool too. Third idea could be to organize a massive parade, a peak earth parade in which there will be marching bands and big, enormous balloons and people on on floats dancing and partying and maybe you're blasting episodes of the peak earth podcast out over speakers to the crowd. You can call it the peak earth parade. And yeah, those, those are just a few ideas off the top of my head if uh, you of course don't have to do any of that really appreciate you taking the time to tune in there are infinite podcasts that you could be listening to and the fact that chose this one is awesome so thank you and i'll quit rambling now thanks again hope you enjoy this episode with dina how are you i'm good i'm excited to be here stoked to connect looking forward to hearing from you you have deep wisdom and a lot of unique perspectives on a lot of things that I'm, I'm curious about. So thank you for taking the time to join me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I'd like to start by just reading this quote from your website because it struck me as, as really interesting. And you said, when I first understood how the nervous system works, I was fucking gobsmacked. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, let me, let me share about that. So the moment that I'm talking about came from this 20 minute YouTube video that I found that was literally titled how the nervous system works. It was an introduction to polyvagal theory. And this was kind of coming off of around nine ish years of being like really obsessed with mindset work, this, you know, like Jocko willing, like discipline equals freedom, like that whole, I don't know. I feel like everybody goes through that phase and I had just completely burnt myself out. I was like trying all these mindset programs. I was doing cognitive behavioral therapy and I was like, why do I hate how I feel so much? Like this is literally an awful human experience. And so a couple of things happened. I heard the term nervous system and something in my body kind of just like lit up. And I was like, I'm, I'm very much a, um, you know, something interests me and I'll spend the next 48 hours making it my entire personality and I need to know everything about it. So I was like, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I, I started researching the nervous system, come, ac- come across this YouTube video, and just so simply, this woman explained the three dominant states. There, are, you know, there's there's more micro states, but the three dominant states that we really evolved to move through. And it was the first time where I really recognized that essentially something below my neck existed and had actual importance in the way that I experienced reality and the way that I felt in my body. And it was the first time that I really understood that your mind and your thoughts does not create your reality. And not only that, but the way the body works when you're in certain states described all of these symptoms that I had been experiencing for a long time that, you know, when I went to, you know, Western medical doctors, it was like, take this pill, do this, like, you know, you're totally fine. And meanwhile, I'm like, I literally am depressed and I don't enjoy my life. So like, I'm not okay but you're telling me I am. So I watched this video and I just sat there and then I burst into tears and just had this massive like energy expulsion from my body. And then this huge 
experience of relief where I was like, oh, okay, like there isn't actually something wrong with me. My body's been doing what it's supposed to do this whole time. And okay, now there's actually a clear path forward. So it's just a total reality, reality shift for me. Wow. I love yeah. that something like a video on the internet can do that for you. And I'm, I'm sure it does it for other people as well. And now you're creating videos and probably doing that for other people. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, I think, you know, sometimes as I guess what I would consider creators, like when you create and you put something online, it there, there's so many nuances to it. There's like creators, there's influencers, there's educators, there's, you know, people who are like full on doctors. And so sometimes it's so easy to feel like what you're posting is, I don't know, like, is it interesting enough? But then you'll post something and like, I get messages all the time now of people just saying like, wow, like you, you know, like you changed my life or like I saw a six second video that you posted and it made me realize that like I have a dysregulated nervous system and you know, that the, the environment that I live in is like not healthy. And I'm like, that's so, that's so incredible that just like a six minute or a six, a six second audio can do that for someone. Wow. Yeah, it is. It is absolutely, especially if if you think about, you know, that moment where you decided to create it and then decided to post it, there were probably doubts along the way where you're thinking like, oh, this isn't worth, you know, making. Oh, yeah. My, <laughs> it, it was really funny because I just started sharing my own, you know, like nervous system regulation journey. I was the director of sales for this Colombian American tech company. I was living in Colombia and I had like no plans whatsoever to be doing what I'm doing right now. And I was like, yes, I'm going to be this like boss babe tech sales girl for the rest of my life. And I'm just going to like regulate my nervous system on the side, share a little bit about it on my Instagram story. It's fine. And I like randomly downloaded TikTok one day and like posted something as a joke. And it my first post ever went viral. And it just like kickstarted this whole thing. And I, and I was just kind of like, okay, I'm going to just, I'm going to just embrace this, I guess. And here we are two years later. And now I've left that whole life behind and I'm doing this for a living, which is kind of amazing. Wow. Yeah. Really amazing. I guess, how do you perceive that the way that your first video that you made went viral and unlocked this whole new life, completely different from what you had currently, you know, at that mm -hmm. moment had planned for yourself? There's so many ways that I feel about it, but I think, and I'm sure that we can kind of get into this. Like I'm really into what is called like the, the psychosomatic, um, th yeah, the psychosomatic side of things. So, you know, like the, that relationship between, between the body and the mind and a lot of wounding as it relates to the nervous system and a huge thing for me, which is still something in my life. And this relates to the video, I promise is I simultaneously believed I was smarter than everybody in my life for my whole life, but felt so scared of like really trying to do something in case I failed and realized that I wasn't actually smarter than everyone. And it was like this whole weird psychosomatic protective loop that my body developed to kind of prevent me from ever like really going after it. And one of the ways that I really felt that a lot was people don't listen when I talk. Like, you know, they don't, they're not really listening to me. And so I was always over explaining or speaking really loud or, you know, being super extroverted, whatever it was. And so this, this first video that was actually probably one of like the most vulnerable things that I'd ever shared, you know, in a public forum, like totally thinking it was just going to get lost in the algorithm that was TikTok and having that be something that people were like, tell me more. What is this like? It, it was I think that it like it hit on such a deep part of that wounding and not in a bad way, like it is what it is, but it, it actually gave me this sense of like, oh, that like these deeper parts of me that I've kind of kept hidden are actually maybe the things that people want to see and hear about. And that was a really healing experience. And then I was able to kind of jump on that and start testing out like, oh, you don't want to hear this overly, um, you know, all of these psychology terms, like you want to hear the real, real feelings. You want to hear what it's like to be dysregulated. Okay. Like I can do that. Wow. Awesome. The, it, it takes a lot of courage too, I think to, and props to you for, you know, making, making the, making the moment to be able to 
create space and pour your authentic emotions into the medium that is a short form video on the mm -hmm. internet that anybody and everybody can watch. It's, I don't think that's an easy thing to do. I, I know that's not an easy thing to do. So props to you for, for pulling that off. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think now you mentioned the, the body mind uh, or the, the body and mind, which is something that I'm pretty obsessed with as, as well. I think the dualistic approach of and the atomistic separation between the body and mind has done just unfathomable amounts of harm to the humans that have installed that idea into their into their body mind and it's it's something that i guess is has, has been a core understanding of my life especially when it comes to the way that i you know, position my body whether it's posture or the movement that i'm able to engage in i find that my thoughts are able to flow more and i'm less less depressed if i'm sitting all the time i feel more depressed and it's, my body's like literally depressed, like a king toes. Yeah. I'm not able to, to, to flow. And I'm guessing that this is a key understanding within the primary parts of your, your study and, and, and what you share and everything that, that you're involved with. And I guess I'm curious how this has unfolded over time within your understanding of it and then how you've applied it into your mm -hmm. life. Yeah, so I think something that is, you know, we all have unique stories. And I think, you know, I, I went to school for accounting and finance. I hated it in the real world. I like I literally quit my job within three months after spending like four years working towards this like really prestigious position in an accounting firm because I got into that position and was like, screw this. And when when I look back, that decision actually was me listening to a signal or cue from my body. I just didn't know that that's what I was doing. And that decision kind of triggered a bunch of other decisions, which was, okay, well, I'm going to figure out how to do tech sales. I've never done this before. Okay. Oh, I'm actually kind of a good entrepreneur. And being an entrepreneur, in my opinion, especially in this day and age, is probably the fastest way, if you're, if you're kind of like up for it, to become a regulated person and understand how your body and mind works because you quite literally don't have any other choice but to confront resistance like over and over and over again. And resistance is fear, shame, guilt, grief, all of the emotions that we don't want to feel. So for me, it was the combination of listening to something deeper in my body saying like, you're not meant to be here, like in these situations, whatever it was, combined with this kind of obsession of, you know, like, why are humans the way they are? And for a long time, this came in the form of studying mindset work, you know, this like discipline equals freedom. And I was really, really bought into that. And then I read the book Sapiens. And this is where I think maybe the way that I approach working with the body is very different than a lot of psychologists and therapists. I really value and deeply believe in evolutionary biology, I think that that is one of the best ways that we can inform ourselves about how our body is supposed to be working. And it's not just taking this psychology-based approach. And then matching evolutionary biology with a developmental psychology, which is kind of a mouthful, but how is, what, what is the arc of human development that is supposed to happen for a person to be able to embrace living, which to me is the full spectrum of the human experience. It's everything from grief and deep shame all the way to ecstasy and joy and peace and contentment. And in order to do that, you need to be regulated. You need to have a felt sense of safety in the body. And these were all kind of little tidbits that I was picking up from here, from there. You know, I remember reading in Sapiens about, you know, when we discovered fire, like, you know, that took human beings and flipped us to be kind of at the top of the food chain for the first time, pretty much ever, you know, like in the history of homo sapiens existing. But what this also did was it created a new environment of light for us. And like, you know, now we're, we're talking a lot about like circadian health and understanding all this, how it relates to the nervous system. Well, your nervous system fundamentally is regulated through light. And so like all of these things, I kind of just started to pick up along the way and seeing this puzzle piece come together that was a combination of ancestral wisdom that had been lost, but also recognizing that we're not hunter gatherers. I can't live like a hunter gatherer and I do need to have modern solutions for modern challenges. And so that's kind of been my journey has been picking all of these different pieces up and slowly integrating them in my life. And 
as I have been doing that, it's been really, it's been really incredible because there's been in on one hand, such a fundamental transformation. Like I had, I started exhibiting signs of chronic illness when I was in grade three. Um, and from grade three up until about three years ago, I was like, I had intense cystic acne, constant skin infections, um, digestive issues, extreme anxiety, depression, fatigue, like you, you name it. Like I just had the full spectrum of it, autoimmune disorder, like whatever it was. Um, 90% of that is just gone now in my body. It's, it's been like completely eradicated because of the way that I live and the way that I work with my body. And now it's this kind of almost coming full circle because I've implemented so many of these things that are very physical around circadian health, um, you know, ancestral living. And this full circle piece is coming back to even like that, that video that I watched the 20 minute video about the nervous system, which is the power of our emotions that I think we have just touched the surface with. And they're related something called somatization, which is the way that they actually physically manifest in your body. And that's kind of the full circle moment I've been brought back to. And that I'm now kind of more deeply integrating in my life now is like, how, you know, how can it get better? And how can I work on this even deeper level, if you want to call it bioenergetics, whatever you want to call it. So I'll pause there because that was a lot of information. Um, but yeah. Beautiful riff. And there's so many different directions we go from there, but it's, it's a great backstory and, and overall view of, of where, where you're, you're at with a lot of this. And I guess I'd like to maybe take a, a pause on the nervous system because we've mentioned it a few times. I'd like to just maybe nail down a, a definition for everyone listening because when I, I hear that, I imagine like the brain and then the brain stem and then all the nerves shooting out. It almost looks like a lightning bolt of electricity kind of shooting mm -hmm. out throughout the body if we were to pull it out. Is that somewhat accurate? Yeah. And so what we're also talking about here, primarily, so there's, there's many different parts of the nervous system. So we're talking primarily about the part of your nervous system that is responsible for responding to stress, which is your autonomic nervous system. And that has that parasympathetic branch and the sympathetic branch. And what's really important to understand is that your nervous system communicates through nerves. You have something called also a soma sensory part of your nervous system, which is the nerves that kind of sit close to the edge of your skin. All of these things are responsible for something called neuroception, which is scanning your environment and then dictating the appropriate response in terms of the level of threat that's currently present. Your nervous system is extremely complicated. The way that I think of it is, again, from the evolutionary perspective, your brain is actually the most recent development of your human body. It's incredible and it's powerful, but it is actually the youngest part of your nervous system. And this is also paired with the understanding that 80% of the signals that go between your body, your body and your brain go from the body to the brain and only 20% go from the brain to the body makes a lot of sense. Because if, because if this part essentially that's of the neck and below has been evolving for, you know, potentially millions and millions of years, and then this incredible brain, which allows us to be more specific, has only been evolving for a couple hundred thousand years, we really need to under, we really need to understand that those cues are kind of coming up the nervous system through the nerves and communicating to the brain so that we can take more specific actions. So that's a little bit kind of how the nervous system sits in the body and the way that it operates. Beautiful. And, and that makes me imagine a metaphor that is drawn out in a, in the book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, where the brain is described as system one thinking and system two thinking. And it's like a rider on an elephant where we've got this little, you know, neocortex of our brain sitting on this giant elephant. And a lot of people are trying to guide the elephant, you know, whipping it, but the elephant's going to do what the elephant wants to do. And if it's scared, it's going to go trampling off. And you're, as the rider, we're sort of riding that uh, wave instead of being able to kind of work with the elephant and, and allow the elephant to kind of guide mm -hmm. us. Is that somewhat of an accurate metaphor to, to align with, with the nervous system? A hundred percent. And I love what you said, because I'll, I've also described it in the past. It's like, can you imagine your body and your emotions and your feelings are like this mountain and you're trying to move this mountain by like hooking up a horse cart, like to the base of the mountain and trying to pull it like you're, you're, you're not going to get anywhere. Like, I don't know, maybe you're going to shake it a little bit. But this is what happens when people try and use purely mindset work or cognitive behavioral therapy that is completely focused on 
essentially tracking every single thought that you have and challenging it and trying to actively replace it with positive thinking or, or something else, all that does is push you further into a state of hypervigilance where you're having to constantly be analyzing yourself versus feeling what it is that you're experiencing. And so that would be the equivalent of this elephant that is thirsty, seeing water over here that you can't see because your human whatever is like, no, 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 I can't see that. And you're trying to rip the elephant to go over here. And the elephant's like, dude, I'm just fucking thirsty. Like I just, I literally need some water to live my best life right now. And you're like, no, I'm going to deprive you of that because that's not what these other people told me that you're supposed to want. So you're like yanking this elephant over to one side, but like, are you going to ever really actually get it to want to go somewhere else? No, it's going to go kicking and screaming or it's not going to go at all. It's so bizarre being human. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the, oh, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> and I've, and I, I, I've come to this kind of uh, suspicion or, or conceptualization where almost all of life kind of comes down to this concept that you're outlining where it's it, a lot of it is just how we feel. It, it's, you know, regardless of all the material that we're able to accumulate in a mass and of the, the lifestyle that, that we're able to create, a lot of it is just how we, we feel about, you know, what we're, what, what we're experiencing every day. That's kind of what leads you to leaving a good life or a bad life is like, oh, how do I feel about this? And how can I then leverage that understanding to better guide myself through the web of reality, integrating kind of my, my body mind and it's really, it can be a, a really tricky game, especially with the, the Western mindset, like, like you mentioned earlier, the, the separation of the, the, the brain and the body. And then that leads to uh, pharmaceuticals for a lot of people, which probably isn't getting to the root cause. It sounds like you are getting to the root cause with, with, with the approach that, that you're outlining. One of the things that I loved that you mentioned is, um, you know, kind of navigating reality and what, what I've really come to realize, and this is something I'm still kind of, I'm like integrating on a deeper level is to me, nervous system dysregulation or dysregulation of a human is when you are unconsciously being forced to deny large parts of your reality because you have not known how to process them. And so they are living as active threats in your body, but you can't escape your body. So you're forced to shut down large parts of yourself in order to exist in a body that doesn't feel safe to exist in. And so one of the most painful realizations I think of being human is that we can't escape ourselves and we can't escape reality. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying before, which is being regulated increases your capacity to experience. It doesn't mean that you're going to only experience sunshine and rainbows. So it is insane being a human like, oh, you're telling me that in order to have a consistent experience of feeling safe in my body, I need to actually on some level accept all of these traumatic things that happened to me. I need to accept that. I know this might be a really intense example, but this is like the real people that I work with. Like my brother died, my um like I had to, you know, like immigrate to another country because my entire family was in danger. I, you know, grew up with an alcoholic father. My mom left me when I was a kid. I have been in like six abusive relationships in a row or, you know, like I burnt myself out so much at work and I have no real friends and I spent all my time working. Like all, all of these things are the real, ex are, are real experiences that every single human has to some degree. And so what we're really saying to, to be regulated is to on some level accept that all of those have actually happened and they make up the fabric of our reality. But so do so does like the other side of the spectrum of like love and contentment and peace and, and connection. That's really difficult to do. Like that is, it's insanely difficult. Yeah. I think yeah. We, <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, it, life gets dark. It, it really gets, gets so dark and it, it's difficult one to like let go of, of the dark things that happen because i think our, our brains all sort of have this negativity bias where we kind of give more weight to negative things in our environment or things that have happened to i guess potentially make sure it doesn't happen again maybe is the is person why would it it's a bummer because then the great things like you mentioned all, all the love and the joy that those are kind of overshadowed by the, by the larger dark aspects of of reality and especially when we think about school i know you i was reading your your bio that you have on your website and and going through the early years at 
or in, in, in our industrial school system was a was a, a dark dark uh, decade or two for you and and I know myself school was was pretty terrible I hated it and I don't think anyone really coasts through that experience just from a, a baseline nervous system regulation level because it's all so dysregulated yeah okay you bring up a really interesting topic I want to kind of there's like two things that I want to touch on here so one thing that is like I'm I'm really happy to share this it's like it's personal but it's it's really important to me is I recently decided to have children and I spent like my whole life it was like a core part of my personality it was like hell no like I'm this boss babe like I'm gonna like what I can do for humanity is like just be this I don't know representative of women that like you know you can do everything that men can do like I was really really bought into all of that um like daddy issues we can like literally get into that but that that has been as as I've gone on this healing journey and as I have felt safer in my body and been connected on this like mental somatic and spiritual level turns out I actually do want to have kids and I was just absolutely terrified at having kids in a society that disconnects you from the main things that allow you to enjoy having kids and that also has completely, in my opinion, degraded what a quality partnership is and, and like, you know, what's needed to be the kind of person that can parent a child and not just like have a kid because they're two very different things. And one of the things for me that what that, you know, pushed me so far away from having kids was getting bullied so badly, like what you're talking about when I was younger. And you know, still to this day, there's like this burning question in my body of like, why me? You know, like, was I, you know, like, and I think that connects to a core part of my teaching and area of study, which is shame. And I still am processing so much shame related to those years of my life where for some reason, this group of kids just decided that I was wrong. Like things about me were just wrong. And they made it their mission, like, you know, in front of the class every day. Like, my nickname was Shrek. I got called an ogre from the time that I was, like, 12 to 16 years old. Like, the time where everyone's having, like, their first crush and this and that. And it was, like, a joke in school to touch me because it would be disgusting because I was an ogre. And these were kids that up until that point, I had thought were my friends. Like, we'd gone to preschool together. We, you know, like, our parents knew each other. And it just flipped flipped one day. And that caused so much shame. Like I was, you know, in grade eight, like I was on the verge of being suicidal. Like it it was just so intense to experience. And when I thought about having kids, like absolutely I'm not exposing them to that. And so that I think is also a really clear example of how not having a society that values genuine human well-being disconnects us from this very innate primal animalistic part of ourselves, which not everybody wants to have kids. But for me, it was such a clear thing. As soon as I felt safe, safe in my body, yes, I would love to be a parent. So yeah, I just wanted to comment on, on a few things with that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that that is yeah it's it's really disturbing that these things happen and and that there's not there's no principles or protocols in place to sort of recover or or remediate or regenerate from that and we all are pretty much left to seek on our own and and figure it out and then we get the opportunity to to share that i guess that's sort of the hero's journey concept where where we go off and into the darkness we find you know the, the cure for our, ourselves and then we can bring it back to, to the others and, and share it and hopefully provide some service to the world and, and help others in, in some way that we can and it is it is beautiful to come full circle like like you have to essentially reject all that life is and now embracing it in, in such a full and, and present and powerful way is is an amazing journey do you think this mm-hmm. level of healing and heroic journeying is, is available to everyone out there i think that i would like to say yes but i don't fully believe that and not because the individual themselves themselves are incapable i 
okay, there, there's two layers of this. There is, there is the layer of what I would consider systemic trauma. So if you, like, I, when I look at my life, I'm like, I had, a, there's like a lot of traumatic things that I experienced that fucked me up. I also was born into an upper middle class family. English as my first language. I'm, you know, tall, white in Canada. Like there, I had a lot of privilege. And so as I was going through this healing journey, even, yes, I was really alone and I was like making my own way. And, you know, I always knew that, you know, like if it really came down to it, like I could reach out to my parents for money or whatever, or this. And so I was able to, I was able financially to afford a pretty high level of support from paid coaches and therapists that gave me a lot of the emotional safety that I needed to do the healing. I don't believe that every person has access to that depending on the environment that they are born in. And therefore I, be I believe that even if somebody is in, in, is innately capable, that it doesn't always mean that they're going to get the healing that they deserve. And that's a really harsh reality. It's not true for everybody. I've met a lot of people that have come from circumstances and have gone on this full arc healing journey that I am just so incredibly in awe of. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why this might be another little tangent. So I'll just briefly mention it is being in integrity in my business with how I want to help people comes from being trauma informed and not going down maybe some of this like super exclusive coaching, like, you know, in order to work with me, the minimum that you can pay is like $800 kind of thing. Like I, the, the most dysregulated people in the world are typically the people that have the least amount of money and like need the most help. So yeah, that's what I'll say on that. I, I, like, I do believe that every single human being has the yearning within them to be whole. And that they can feel that they are not whole because they have been shamed and suppressed and dysregulated and not taken care of. I believe that every person has the ability to be whole. It's also being realistic about the society that we exist in and that sometimes there's just a lot working against you. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I, that resonates with me as, as well. There's just so much, even if we, even if you just think about something like, nutrition or, or nourishment that is expensive. And then there's also the, the time, you know, the time pressure of like, how much time do you have to be able to be practicing these, these healing modalities versus potentially working, you know, 10, 14 hours and all the illnesses that, that can be sort of brought in the disease, I guess, I guess really now focusing on, on the concept of disease, it makes me think that it almost all maybe not all of it, but a lot of it does stem from this regulated nervous system. I know you mentioned that while you're going through school, having this experience every day manifested in, in disease and it's some of it physical on your skin. I know I also went through about a decade of having acne and it's just like pretty debilitating, even though it's on just the surface level thing, like literally on the surface, but it really ruins self-confidence and and makes really self-conscious. And then that kind of really separates one from the experience of life. And then that often manifests as depression or anxiety, or at least kind of snowballs. Like a lot of people end up in this vicious cycle where one thing is perceived as like unhealable or, or dysregulated, and then just goes down in deeper, deeper levels without being able to recover. Um, was that sort of a similar experience on, on your end? Yeah. And I, I actually recently started reading this book called The Hidden Cause of Acne. And it is very interesting. It, it, it relates um, cystic acne specifically to fluoride and talks about how there is that psychosomatic link between like, okay, like I have all this stuff all over my face. Of course, it's going to be difficult to like, you know, feel confident. And in a sense, at least the way I experienced it was like, there's always an elephant in the room when I was talking to someone, like we're both ignoring the fact that there's like all this crap on my face and they were just being nice to me. And it made me feel so disconnected. And it made me feel very other than and different and shamed and isolated and like undesired. And in this book, they talk a lot about how um, there's that connection or just the purely emotional piece, but that also potentially there is something to 
certain people being more impacted by fluoride and that actually even from like a neural neurobiological perspective um, can contribute to depression. So I think it's really interesting because the other thing that this book talks about, like studying, you know, different, different areas around the world and when teenagers even started to experience acne would be, you know, they are like living in their hometown, their village, whatever. And then they graduate, they go to the big city and they immediately break out. And it's like, well, yeah, of course, you know, like there's things like McDonald's and blah, 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 that they might be eating, but they're also now on like city water that has been fluoridated and there's fluoride in the water that is used to make the food that they're consuming, like that wasn't happening at home. And so this is where, you know, I get really, I get really angry and overwhelmed sometimes at how disconnected like our physical environment is from the one that's healthy for us. And I know you're so, you know, so into that. Like I, I literally can't find a place to buy raw milk where I live. It's completely illegal. If there's a farm that will do it, it's snapped up in two minutes and people are driving like three hours each way to go and get it. Like, it's just ridiculous. Um, so yeah, you know, like all, all of this contributes and so where I live right now, I've just been renting this house and this like really beautiful town um about two hours north of Toronto I've gone to the grocery store three times since I've moved here and I bought all all of my food from the local farmer's market and this has not only been amazing for me physically but like I can literally feel deep in my bones like this is how we're supposed to live I have like my pickle lady like I literally go and buy pickles from her she ferments food like I know her name is Susan cool like there's her and then there's a guy Brandon that I buy my seafood from. And like every day I walk up and he's like shrimp. Like he just knows. Yep. Thank you. Like I need my shellfish. And then there's, you know, like I'm in Canada, like there's where you buy your maple syrup. There is, you know, where, you know, that you want to get potatoes from, but you don't want to get the tomatoes from there. And, and like having this interaction has also been such a beautiful spiritual experience for me. And I can feel the cohesiveness and this kind of tightening, like fabric of the community in my own body too. And there's a rhythm and a, and a cycle and a flow to it that we're supposed to experience. Like if you're, you know, before I was super into pro metabolic eating and I'm like, it's the middle of Canada and I'm chugging coconut water and orange juice. Like my body's like, what? No, we can't use this. Like it is literally minus 20 degrees right now. And there's no sunshine, like fucking relax. And it's like, what I should have been having is like bone broth from the, you know, that I made with bones from a farm that was like local to me. And so, yeah, anyway, like, I just wanted to comment on that. Cause like, it is, it is expensive to eat that. Like I, you know, like I'm by myself and I spend, I spend a lot of money on food each month. Like people look at me and they're like, what, what? And I'm like, yeah, like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look amazing and feel amazing my whole life. So like, that's why I'm doing this, but like, it freaks people out sometimes. So yeah, I just wanted to comment on that. <laughs> Yes, it's it's such an excellent investment. And I love what you were saying about the rhythm of being at the market and having everyone who sort of has a relationship with you. There, there's something there that is difficult to speak about or even measure, probably impossible to measure, but there's a definitely a communitas, like a, an energy, a, a heart energy that you get interacting with the people who actually make the food, who really care about you. They care about the food. It's so different from going to the grocery store where it's a cashier who really doesn't want to be there. They have no connection to the food. This food's flown in from thousands of miles away. <laughs> and it's just night and day in, in terms of the way you feel after after you buy that food. And that is nervous system regulation. That, like you're saying, just being able to interact with people, look at them in the eyes. They care, we, you know, we care about each other. And it's just like, wow, this is a really nourishing experience as opposed to the beep, beep. Beep. All right, exactly. this is you know, twenty three dollars. <laughs> um, I think you've actually yeah. had him on your podcast, Ryan Ryan Carter, the yes. Vite. Yeah. So, um, him and I started working together January of this year. Like him as as um, a health coach for me. And one of the things that he said to me that has always really stuck with me is like, when you eat, you're inviting the external world like inside your body. And it was just, I don't know, for me, it was like it was such a powerful visual, and I'm like oh my God, like, I don't want, you know, exactly what you're saying. Like something that has been like passed through a bunch of different people's hands has been like sitting inside. Like, I don't know if you guys have Loblaws, like whatever, you know, like our grocery store here, 
then yeah, there's this like cashier that's like a chain smoker that like can't even make eye contact with me because she just like hates that she's there. And I'm like, yep, thanks. Gonna go nourish my body now. Like that just does not, just does not vibe for me. Um, and like I was even, um, it, you know, it started to get colder here. It's fall, like the leaves are changing and there, you know, there is a real, um, a real disconnection from the natural cycles of, of nature as well. And it, it's so beautiful how much this mimics our body. And what I like, just to kind of like briefly explain that when you, when your nervous system is responding to a stress or a stressor, there's a, an upregulation and a downregulation cycle that happens that represents a complete response meaning that you have been able to move through the necessary states to come back to homeostasis or a baseline. Having a dysregulated nervous system is when you get stuck in one of the states where you're in response to a threat and you stay there and your body is not able to downregulate or re-regulate you. And this is really interesting because it's cyclical. Like there's a there there's okay, the threat you're you're chilling. You're chilling, you're in parasympathetic, rest and digest something comes at you, you get a stressful email, your body starts to activate, you go into fight or flight, your digestive system kind of turns off, your body starts showing you a scarier world on purpose so you can deal with the threat and you can mobilize. So this is where you're moving towards or away from the threat. If that threat doesn't go away, you cannot run away from it and you can't fight it. You will collapse. You'll go into something called dorsal vagal shutdown. Is it shocking that this is also the exact same symptoms of depression? Probably not. And this is where your body is like, I'm going to die. So I'm going to shut down and I am going to numb myself so that whatever death I experience is going to be a less, like least painful. So it's like, if you've seen a, a, like a deer playing dead, it's like that kind of idea, your body kind of goes into that state. Then let's just say this threat eventually does go away. Your body is supposed to then pass back through that slightly activated state back down into rest or digest. So there's this full cycle that is supposed to be completed that mimics in like so many different ways, the cycles of like initiation, growth, um, and then, you know, decay and rebirth in, in like the world and nature around us. And I live in a, you know, an area where we have like four very distinct seasons. So, you know, it's, it's very obvious there, but that is also something that I really try and get people connected to when they work with me is like, you know, as a man, you have a 24 hour hormonal cycle. Notice how you feel at different points of the day. As a woman, you have a 24 hour hormonal cycle and you have an infradian rhythm. Like your, your hormones are so, so different, you know, like these four different weeks of the year. And the more we allow that to be present in our lives, because it's happening, whether we want it to or not, the more we can actually begin to work with the body and come into those states of coherence. I just took that a totally different way, but that's just where my brain was going. Beautiful. That was, that was awesome. That gave me a great visual as to what is happening under the hood in a lot of ways with my nervous system. And it makes me think a few things pop into mind. This, this idea of, of a mirage threat or, a, or a, sort of a false alarm. I feel like we're somewhat inundated with these potentially where a few examples come to mind would be something like shallow, shallow breathing, I think is, is maybe one way that we could signal um, a high, high alert, you know, state or mm -hmm. seeing something on social media that you don't, you know, the algorithm serves you a video of some emergency situation that has nothing to do with you, but that could potentially still trigger you. Or maybe you're going for a walk in the city and there's a crazy homeless man yelling, you know, that may also be, you know, those are three examples that come to mind with, am mm -hmm. I somewhat on, on the right track where these are, you know, oh God, yeah. in the fight so one of the things I can't remember exactly where, oh yeah, there's this book I read called The Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. Incredible book. And um, in the book, they talk about something called evolutionary mismatch or evolutionary mismatch theory. And this essentially states that our physiology is mismatched for our current environment. And that as a result of that, there are going to be consequences to our bodies, to our physiology and to just yeah like our bodies as humans and so what you're getting at is a really clear example of this where humans are incredibly complex and dynamic 
systems that are not separate from anything else, you know, not to get too esoteric. It's like you and I also make up the fabric of reality, even though it seems different and outside of us. And like, that is just, that is just incredible. And we have evolved in tandem because we are part of everything around us for, you know, millions of years to, to come to exist how we are right now. And then you look at the pace of, I don't even want to call it evolution because I think so much of it is fucked up, but you know, the, the pace of newness of change that we've had in the last couple hundreds of years is so far beyond the pace of evolution at a true like biological level that of course there's going to be ramifications. Our biology cannot handle the levels of stimulation that we have today. I'm not supposed to be able to go online and see a thousand different people within the matter of 10 minutes that are also all probably a thousand people that are so incredibly beautiful compared to the average person. And that's also why their content is going viral online. So there's so, so much overstimulation that, and this, this is um, a really good moment actually to describe um, trauma and stress. So stress is a temporary departure from that rest or digest state. Someone cuts you off in traffic. Fuck you, buddy. 10 minutes later, you're not even thinking about it and you can downregulate, downregulate again. Trauma is something that overwhelms you to the point where you are not able to downregulate again. But what I believe that we have, we have this insane thing happening where we have such a chronic level of stress as a result of the overstimulation, including all those examples that you give, that it turns into a trauma. Because if, if, the, if it's just this kind of constant low level stress that never quite lets you get back into that rest or digest, well, that's actually a trauma because you're stuck in this dysregulated state. And one example that I love to give of um, evolutionary mismatch in action called an evolutionary mismatch trap is perfume. So it smells good. You want to lean into, you, you know, you want to lean in, you want to smell it. It smells nice. It's pretty. Um, you know, guys like when girls smell good, we like when guys smell good, but you're literally inhaling toxic chemicals that are dysregulating your hormones and our neurotoxins. So we did not used to have perfumes made of neurotoxins, right? Like hunter gatherer days, like you smell, you smell a flower. And for the most part, if the flower smelled good, like it's not going to kill you or it's not going to completely like destroy your gut microbiome. We do not have that. Now there are so many things around us that we we don't even, we don't even know that they're bad for us. And maybe we even think that they're good. Like I used to, you know, spray perfume right here, right here on my wrist, all on my lymph nodes, right? Like all my lymph nodes. And then women are like, I have breast cancer. And it's like, well, yeah, you're pumping your tissue, like the most sensitive tissue of your body with chemicals. And so that's an example of an evolutionary mismatch trap that we get trapped into. And we just, we don't even know that we don't know. And this is why body literacy, nervous system literacy, like understanding that, that we're still, our bodies are still prepared to live in this more ancestral environment is so key to just being regulated and like enjoying, you know, enjoying your life and, and preventing, um, you know, disease from happening in your body. That is really important. Thank you for, for sharing that. And I'm sure we could riff on a lot of similar examples that, that, come across as the normal things in society that actually end up being sort of toxins. We mentioned a few like fluoride, um, mentioned light a little bit earlier. I'm sure we could dive a little bit deeper into that, but I'm also wanting to kind of draw out this central sort of theme that's emerging throughout the conversation as we started talking about the separation of, of body and mind. Well, we're actually body mind. Then we kind of touched on food a little bit. Well, I guess we're a continuum of like body, mind, food. And now we're talking about, well, actually, you're also the environment and the people around me. So it's like, okay, I'm, I'm a body, mind, food, environment being that's, that's already walking through or coalescing with everything and becoming this energy wave as a result of how I choose to interact with the environment and the food and, and the body and the mind. And it's, it's an interesting sort of way to engage with the flow of reality, like, like we're mm. kind of riffing on. And, and I feel like it's almost like we... So, something that just boggles my mind that is almost a, a central theme of this entire podcast is exploring the idea that we're, we're born into this time. It's really, like you mentioned, we're experiencing this mismatch, which is a really important concept where we're completely detached from everything that we're supposed to be aligned with. And, and it's our 
generation's responsibility or opportunity to get to kind of reconnect with that. But then you've also got people who are pushing it further. Like, no, I want an AI brain and I want to go to Mars and I want to forget about it's, it's so much chaos going on. How do you find the, the time and the space and the peace and the emotional fortitude to kind of hold, hold your space, even though it's very different from what a lot of the mainstream is, is doing? Mm. Okay. Love this question. It is also a huge question. So to be, you know, to, I guess, share from a place of just really genuine transparency is I'm, I'm very deep in the arc of integrating that right now. So I'm not expressing this from a place of like, I figured that, you know, like I figured out how to do this. Um, so, you know, to give, to give an example, I find that when I first wake up in the morning, so, okay, actually to go, to go back even further, you know, a lot of people they're they're like, don't drink coffee on an empty stomach. This makes your cortisol. It's like not good for you, blah, blah, whatever it is. I just, I do like I do. And I'm like, I love sitting outside with my coffee in the morning. That's also when I am, I get so many ideas and I tried really hard for a long time to be like, no, I'm going to like not have my phone. I'm going to not have the coffee. I'm going to have an herbal tea. I'm going to journal and I'm going to just be like the, you know, like this soft living girly, like whatever. And I promise this is all going to link together. Um, I'm not that like, like sometimes I am, but like, I am, I am fiery and I'm passionate and I have big ideas and I just like, really just like to go by how I feel. And for me, as soon as I started having my coffee while I was sitting outside under natural light, I got no jitters from it. So I was like, cool, I'm going to just go with that. I'm going to trust what my body is telling me. That's like layer, layer number one of even just being able to operate like that grounds you so much more into feeling okay doing whatever it is that you're doing. Because now I'm not saying, oh, it, is my body actually being honest with me or am I actually jittery and I just can't feel it? It's like, no, 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 no. Like I trust that, that my body's good. Then this other thing about, you know, like the morning routine and being connected and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, this morning I sat outside, I'm listening to the birds chirp. I'm like sipping my coffee and I'm just like feeling all of these ideas surge into my head because I'm not suppressing what feels right for my body. Then I just made an insane amount of TikTok videos, had some ideas, like executed on them. And I was able to like, you know, get it going. So that for me is kind of step one of feeling safe contained as yourself and feeling more certain about the way that you move through life and that you shouldn't be doing other things, but that you're actually allowed to be doing what it is that you're doing is kind of making this choice that you're going to trust what your body tells you that feels good to do. Like, even if it's different than other people, including a lot of the wellness influences that are like, you're probably spiking your cortisol. And I'm like, cool. Well, I sleep through the night. My skin is clear. I don't have a puffy face. Like I'm good. You know, like I'm good and I, and I don't want to operate on fear. So that's kind of layer number one. Um, the second layer to all of this is for me personally, I've struggled a lot throughout my life with feeling that I have so much of this potential, like to be a leader, I have so much potential in how I share and communicate information. And there was always that underlying, like you should be doing more, you know, like get into politics then Dana, like go make a real change like that, you know, that kind of, especially when, you know, we're talking about all the things that we're talking about and I'm looking at like, you know, not to go into it, but I'm like our prime minister, huh? You know, all these things, I'm just like, oh my goodness. So what I really had to take a step back with and say, I believe that I am worthy of enjoying my human experience and that that does not mean that I can't make real change but I don't want to become a martyr. I don't want to spend my whole life suffering just to be like a, I don't know, global figure of we need, you know, like we need to be better. We need to do this. And that was really scary actually to acknowledge that that's what I want and that I don't want to be this martyr and that I want to be someone who makes change by showing what it's like to actually enjoy being yourself in your body and who, you know, like has something to say, that's kind of a second layer. And then on top on, on top of all of that, I love this saying is if, if you accept everything, like you stand for nothing. And I think that that's, that is, I typically don't say it. So maybe harshly, but I'm like, that is weak. We have way too much of that. 
you need to stand for something and you need to be okay with being disliked because you're going to stand for something. And so all of these different layers combined are allowing me to be who I really am, take it, take radical responsibility for who I am and for my evolution as a human while also recognizing that the simple pleasures of like having your coffee outside in the morning and listening to the birds chirp is also allowed to be like a focal part of how I live my life. And I don't need to be this like radical figure, you know, all the time. Tremendous. <laughs> that, is, that is, I, I agree with that so wholeheartedly. And, and this, this idea of trusting yourself is so meaningful. And a lot of people lose sight of this. And I think maybe it's because they're, nervous systems is dysregulated and they don't have a good sense of, of self. And I know personally, I've found that as I've aligned with nature, as I've ameliorated the mismatch and I've regulated my nervous system, I've been able to come more in contact with this idea of self, what we call self. And, and when I do lose my way or I become flustered or lost in the chaos, I kind of lose sight of that and it, it get kind of depressed or anxious. And, and then I have to somehow remember like a light can flash. And it's, oh no, got to get, you know, back, back to, back to the principles and, you know, slow down a little bit and uh, get back, get back in touch with this, you know, the self and then find that I can trust that and navigate mm -hmm. a little bit better. And I love what you said there about doing what something that you enjoy, which I also enjoy is drinking, drinking coffee outside. And then all these ideas flood to you. What, what do you think of ideas and where, where do you think they come from? Okay. I, this might be a little bit, um, sound maybe a little bit like esoteric or philosophical, but for me, it's a very real experience is, you know, whether you believe like God source, the universe, whatever it is like we, you know, um, I, I love Alan Watts. He said, you know, like deep, deep down, you are the universe, like experiencing itself. And it's, it's so true. Like it, it literally, it literally is that it's, it's insane that we are the only animals on this planet that are aware of our consciousness. Like that is just absolutely, or that are conscious, like that is just, sometimes I'm just like, okay, somebody somewhere is running an experiment to see like how, how much we can like hold off the crazy of, you know, like having this experience. So I believe that Dana, as I am, is some unique essence of me combined with my life experience and how that interacts and meets um, this expression of life force, like moving through me. And so there's a real beauty to that because when you, or when I experience almost kind of like this act of surrender and not in a passive you know, over spiritualize, like I have no responsibility, but like, okay, not, I'm not projecting what I want to be experiencing onto my body, but I'm reversing that and saying, okay, whatever I'm experiencing is totally okay. And I may be terrified of it, but like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna suppress you anymore. That is allowing that combination of different pieces to interact together and then move themselves up to a place where they now become a more elegant I, central idea that can be communicated because I now have this amazing prefrontal cortex and I have language. So that's what I think ideas come from. Um, and that when you're regulated, when I'm regulated, I am like, I have ideas about anything. Like I literally could just be like, someone will come up to me and, I, and they'll say something to me. I'm like, oh my God, I have an idea for a business. And they're like, you can do that. Or I have an idea for this or like wh whatever it is. And I just feel like that's amazing. Like that's life force, like, you know, coming out of you. Yeah, it, it is absolutely amazing. And in a lot of ways, it's, it separates the quality of life that you want to live. It's all, it's kind of all about the ideas that we get and then which ones we choose to follow. Cause that's like, it's almost as if we're, we're living the now and then where we go in the future is just these ideas that are presented for us and we get to kind of choose which which door we want to go in and and the quality of those ideas really has to be linked to something it doesn't seem like it's just a random presentation of you know uh, neurons firing it does seem like we are able to kind of cultivate the grounds or the foundation of through which these ideas are rooted in it's like the soil and then they're able to sprout in the uh, 
different kind of garden or, or various mm-hmm. things that we're able to, to cultivate. It's such an amazing part of of life, and and I think we've. I, <laughs> I, somehow an hour has gone by. I feel like I could ask you questions for the next three hours. You'd be able to give me wonderful answers to everything. So I've really appreciated everything that you have have shared so far, and we've gotten to this. I think really covered a, an amazing overview and an array of, of everything. But I'd like to make sure I give you time here to share anything else that you'd like to share that, that we feel like maybe could be a good way to, to add into everything else that we have. Yeah, I think what I'd like to end with is sharing, sharing one kind of general, um, general approach to nervous system regulation, and then offering kind of a few principles to practice applying this. So um, nervous system regulation is not a set of rules. And anybody that tells you that there are rules or specific practices that will regulate your nervous system, don't understand how nervous system works, nervous systems work, and that everybody is different. And that's just something I really want to say. And that and that ties into this example of, well, for me and my nervous system, drinking coffee outside in the morning is really regulating. And to someone else, it might spike their cortisol. And that's totally fine. That is actually allowed to exist in reality. Cool. So that's number one. Principles. There's a few key ones that will really help you conceptualize both how to heal from chronic stress and trauma, but then also how to work with your your body. So number one is that your your body, your emotions, and your thoughts are are always your body's um, response, and you're always responding how you evolved to respond. So that's really important to understand because you might say, wow, how ridiculous of me. I got an email from my boss and I just felt myself have a panic attack and we shame ourselves when in reality, your body's actually perceiving this as a real threat. That is the reality that you need to work with. And your body's actually having an appropriate response based on what it believes is happening. There's nothing wrong with you. So your body's always responding exactly how it evolved to respond. Also gives you amazing amount of permission to just exist and not shame yourself. Um, number two is that you, you have, so safety is how we heal the nervous system, um, safe connection with ourselves and with other people. And so going at the pace of the slowest part of your nervous system is actually the fastest path towards healing to give you a very clear example of what I mean by that. Um, a lot of people will say, I'm going to regulate my nervous system and I'm going to do this 10 day transformative like breath work practice. I'm going to do it every single day for the next 10 days. Well, that's a somatic tool or a nervous system regulation tool that allows you to bring emotions up to the surface. If you do that too fast, too quickly, or you engage in certain types of breath work that are more activating and your body does not have the resilience yet to re-regulate you after, this can actually cause more harm than good to your nervous system. This is why I've I've worked with a lot of people, they do Wim Hof and they feel worse. And that is because, again, your nervous system is unique and what it needs in order to feel safety is unique. Um, Those to me would be the two most important principles to understand. And then the last kind of overarching, which is really the fundamental way that I'm kind of approaching my life, not just my healing journey, but my life is that the opposite of dysregulation is self-expression. And I look at having a regulated nervous system as just foundational health. And then from there, I get to discover more about who Dana is because being me and enjoying my life is not just a list of, you know, holistic practices and, you know, drinking the raw milk and eating regenerative. It's like, cool. Like that's taken care of. Now what, who am I? What do I want to create? What do I want to do? What relationships do I want to have? How do I want to experience life? And so remembering that the end goal is not just to be regulated, to check it off your list. It's to be regulated so that you can like play in your own body and your own mind and find out more about what your authentic self-expression is. Beautiful. Really appreciate your courage, creativity, and and story. Thank you for taking the time to share with with us all here, here today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This was an awesome conversation. Love it. Thank you.